my sister passed away, like I was just saying, when I was in third grade from acute myeloid leukemia. Um, there's two different forms of leukemia. Acute myeloid leukemia normally happens when you're above 50 or 60 and your cells start degrading. Um, there's a much less aggressive version. That is what generally attacks um, young kids. But the entire time it happened, so she was sick from when I was in preschool to when I was in third grade, so just like over three and a half years. Um, there was always ups and downs, like a transplant would go wrong or this medication wouldn't be working or anything like that. So. I was kind of used to my sister having to get flown out to Arizona or flow, fly to this hospital or get this, that, the other thing. I wouldn't say that there was anything that I noticed was super bad. Um, I definitely have a, a very distinct memory of the day of, like when, I, when she actually passed. I guess the most distinct memory I have of the final unwinding was I used to stay at home with my babysitter because obviously my parents were at the hospital. And I remember it was a Tuesday and I was, I woke up and it was like 7.50 and I had to be at school at eight. And I was like, oh, hell yeah. Like my, my babysitter isn't gonna wake me up. Like I'm just gonna keep sleeping. Maybe she's out doing whatever. Kept sleeping, like nine o'clock rolls around, 10 o'clock rolls around. I'm like, okay, like what's going on? Like, why is nobody home? And then my parents and my babysitter all come home. As you could assume, it's just complete chaos. I don't really remember a lot of that day after that. I had this vision, and in this vision, I, I, uh, I looked over at the bed where my mother was in. I was in the couch, right here against the wall, and um, and I saw her get up and leave the room. I saw her struggling to do this because she had uh, both of her legs had been broken because she was dying of um, leukemia, which is a bone cancer. So she was hobbling out of the room. And I remember how frustrated I was that there were no nurses, that nothing was happening. And I got up and I left the room to go after her. And as soon as I left the room, outside were all the nurses stations, everything was the same, but the atmosphere was different and nobody was around. So I knew something had shifted there. And I recognized immediately I was having some kind of a a visionary experience. I, I still have vivid memories of it. So she passed November 11th of that year and she was born on January 31st. And every single year around that time, I mean, it's, you get reminded of it. My mom, my mom would get hit hard, especially like she's crying around it, like a lot of emotional outbursts, understandably. Um, I mean, I don't think it ever necessarily gets easier. I think you just learn how to honor that memory. The Bible's very clear about what happens moments after someone leaves this side of eternity. So the Bible is very comforting in that for those who belong to Jesus Christ. Uh, very comforting. And the Lord, again, for whatever reason, just allowed me to witness it. So, yeah, it has changed. As a pastor, I have to be very careful with how I use that when I'm trying to comfort people. Mm -hmm. um, if they haven't had that experience, then these are just words. And so I, I'm very delicate when I speak about that with someone who's experiencing a loss. Do you feel like you properly coped with it? No, no way. I thought, I think for a long time I thought I had. Um, and as I've learned more about the, the human brain and how to actually like properly get through things, I don't think I've fully processed it. Um, I think I did about as well as I can expect myself to for being a third grader with no real like counseling. Um, I think if I ever truly wanted to get into it, I'd have to go through therapy, which I have looked into. I just don't think it's on the forefront of what I need to do. Um, I've processed it well enough in my family, but I definitely remember there being like a two to three year period of denial. Like, until I was in like sixth or seventh grade where it's just kind of like, oh, that didn't, that didn't happen. Like, I'm not gonna think about that. I don't, I don't have the capacity to. Um, but I've spent, probably spent the last six or seven years trying to amend that, trying to really like reinforce memories and focus on what I did have because I realize now that I can, you can't go back. All I can do is choose to actually honor that memory and be, Locking my heart or locking my brain away from that is only going to make it worse. So I think I've done an okay job of that. As a pastor, my go-to is to try to enter into their suffering uh, as much as they will allow me. 
And so a picture in the Old Testament is when someone would, like Job's friends, would go sit in the ashes with him. Mm -hmm. And as a pastor, I just try and do that. And it's different for every person, but the one thing that speaks, I think, the loudest and with the most clarity is that somebody loves them enough to sit in the ashes with them, to get dirty with them, if, if you will. And that is, I've learned, man, over the years that this is not a time for platitudes. It's not a time to say, well, they've they received their ultimate healing, you know, and uh, you know, heaven has gained a new, you know, these kinds of things. I have a lot of grace for when people say this because they usually say that because they don't know what to say. But typically the best thing to say is nothing, is to just sit with them and be a presence of peace with them.